Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. Some manufacturing companies have the luxury of knowing exactly how many inputs are required to produce a specific number of outputs. Farmers do not have that luxury. In agriculture, production is riddled with risks that can negatively affect production levels and lead to significant losses. These past few months should be proof enough of how risky farming can be. After the region finally saw the end of the worst drought in almost 30 years, farmers now have to contend with the flooding of certain areas, the threat of the marauding fall army worm that has made its way through Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Namibia and Kenya in just a few weeks, and now red locusts that completely decimate the crops they come across said to be breeding in central Zambia. These risks to yield losses are also compounded by losses that farmers can incur post-harvest during storage and transportation, and of course from unexpectedly low market prices. Similarly, livestock and dairy producers must face risks tied to weather and wild animals or pests. Disease is also said to be a very significant risk that could lead to reduced production or, in an extreme case, the shutdown of an entire operation. One study ranked livestock farming as one of the highest risk and most hazardous industries, with workers often undertaking potentially hazardous activities in isolation. And working sheds, dams, chemical stores, machinery and animals posing their own safety risks. Why then do our findings indicate that the uptake of farmers insurance in Botswana is low and has only seen an increase recently when financial institutions started insisting that farmers looking for funding have policies? Doesn't it make sense to counter the risks associated with farming with insurance? Tonight we look at what is available to local farmers in terms of insurance and what could be behind farmers' apparent indifference to such products. We drove out past Litageng to Wingotongaka's farm out in Sisung to hear what challenges she experiences in her endeavours. This climatic change is not the not that they are not being watered, but, but because last week the heat was just too high. We realized the loss of moisture. And we realized the moisture loss was just too high. So the challenge is that we have to do the challenge. We especially at this time, we have to do the challenge. We have to do the challenge. How did I open farming? What say? What did I share? Not just a can of jam. For our digital nations, we reap a lot of the money. We are rich. We are not just selling. We are not just rich. So we are not just rich. 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 We are forced to spray. We are not just rich. 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 So farmers were ordered to remove. A farm next to me is somewhere, just here, junction here, this one. But they were affected. And that is a loss to farmers. And as farmers, they were vegetable production. That loss that the farmers have gone through. Ba baka kompensi tuwa kasi la mweki kipuso. We have farmers ba 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 ni mbala tukalo kidi kumu through foot and mouth, through land disease, meko rumento na anale sabi. Ro na there was an outbreak malo ba ya tuta absoluta where farmers were forced to to do away with their their crops. But haisi kuku rumenta hapo tse sepe kana opehela. Kwa mwe hanele kore kuna lidi insurance tse nidi katla diar ruta se mwe diar raja rinyame. Uh, insurance the crops alone will be able to cover one, two, three. Rao is the whole insurance. Mare Kiro Kitubela Horda are not so robust to educate us as farmers for a Raka insurance. I'm saying this because last year when I started, 
ka October. When the rains started ka November, there was a hailstorm. Miroko yote nele in the space, ina destroy yake sahako, and that was just a loss like that. Hosa na hore, ngabara ka compensation. So ke de ke santse ke le mo lena ne o la gore ke tle ke botse ba di insurance gore i mean natural disasters ba di cover ka tle ke ke di insurance its other things ba se tore to ka natural disasters ba di cover so ke education e re tlhoka re le di farmara gore eh di insurance if they are to cover us ba cover ai because there's a serious loss e le gore you might even get discouraged wa le sa wa bona gore ha nge ka khona now say that an integrated farmer also has her operations out in Gwening West, and she offered an interesting take as to why local farmers may not be taking up agricultural insurance products despite the prevailing risks. I don't have any insurance covered mainly because there are terms and conditions of those insurance policies that makes it unfavorable for some of the farmers to afford it, more especially as small and aspiring uh, farmers. Those include, they would want you to have recommended uh, uh, infrastructures, right equipment, right skills, right people. And, you know, as a small farmer, those are the things that we find that maybe you can just do without, especially since money is involved. What does Ms. Seate propose as the possible solutions towards the challenges faced by farmers in ensuring their operations? I think if us farmers can group ourselves, form association, and then we approach the insurance companies so that they can be able to offer group covers and we can be able to, to, to afford the, the, the infrastructures that I talked about that, that hinders us from getting the insurance covers that, you, that we have to have. I feel the, the, the insurance companies have to come to us farmers, see exactly what we can afford and uh, do policies in that line. Welcome back to First Issues. Having spoken to some farmers about their reasons for the low appetite for agricultural insurance products, we now head to Botswana Insurance Company headquarters here in Haborone to hear the provider's view on this matter. We asked the underwriting manager at the company why she thinks, despite the risks associated with farming, local farmers do not appear to be fully utilizing their services. The demand is there, um, mm. the need is obviously there. Mm. I'll give you an example. There are certain financial institutions that do finance farmers, mm. and for them to finance such farmers, they need security in terms of insurance, so definitely the demand is there. But in the far past two years, we've seen um, a rise in terms of, of the demand. We're seeing a lot of farmers coming through um, for livestock, for horticulture, and other general crops. So in terms of the need, the demand is definitely there in the market. Maybe what we probably need to do is probably as the entire market with our brokers, we need to probably go more out to, to, to advertise more, to talk to different associations in the farming community so that we can make sure that they do understand that the product is available, the product is there. And on the livestock side, uh, we've spoken to some of our colleagues from outside uh, Botswana, I mean from other continents like Brazil. They've actually looked at our policy and they've marveled because it technically covers all sicknesses, all diseases and all accidents, which in most countries, livestock policies do not cover all that. Can you break it down um, to the viewer at home? What is available in detail uh, for every local farmer? For commercial farmers especially, mm. um, we have a product that covers all risks of mortality. That mm. is death from sickness, death from diseases, death from accidents. Um, there's transit cover as well as theft cover. Mm. So this is for animals that are within a confined space. Mm. That's, that's basically what we, we, we cover. And there's a particular product that um, for the farmers with the breeding animals, like who own stud animals, mm. there's a particular cover 
that covers the all risk mortality, that's death from uh, sickness, disease, accidents, and it also goes on to cover for gap cover. In the event that there's a slaughter order that has been issued, we cover the gap between the amount paid by the government and the price of that particular animal. And the free range animals, we tend to restrict the diseases cover. So for diseases, sicknesses, we tend not to cover for animals that are, are on free range. So what we basically do is we can give them uh, limited cover just for fire, uh, for accident, um, a small bit for theft, but it carries certain warranties uh, that goes with that particular policy. And for those that are doing um, feedlots, into feedlots, we have a specific cover for feedlots because um, feedlots would ideally be excluded under our normal livestock policy. So we have uh, cover for feedlots. Once the animals are within that feedlot for a specified period of time, which is quite short, shorter than the ones that are in ranges, and also for transit when the animals are being transported from the feedlot to the operator wherever they are going to be sold to. So we do have that particular cover. That's for animals. Then when you come to your crops, we have two types of policies. Uh, basically, we have a policy that just specifically looks at your horticulture. So it looks at your tomatoes, your green peppers, your potatoes, and that particular cover will cover you for things like your windstorm, your hail, your fire, and certain vegetables like tomatoes, green pepper, uh, and potatoes will be covered for frost. Otherwise, other crops are not affected by frost, so they won't have the frost extension. Basically, that's what we have under our, our, our products. What has been your experience? Let's continue the discussion online or via text. Up next, we speak to some international commentators on the subject of financial literacy. Welcome back to First Issues. We are passionate about financial literacy for a number of reasons. Firstly, literacy can help protect consumers and investors against abuse in the forms of scams and maladministration in an age where financial products are becoming increasingly more complex. And secondly, financial literacy encourages the participation in and consumption of these financial products by individuals, which not only benefits them in terms of wealth creation, but benefits entire industries and therefore national economies. Over 50,000 Botswana and Botswana-owned companies managed to secure shares in the listing of the Botswana Telecommunications Corporation last year. But we wonder whether those that took livestock, dug into their savings, basically begged, borrowed and stole to at least buy the 1,000 pula minimum required, truly understood the nature of their investment. Whether they considered what it means for their percentage of ownership if the Botswana Public Officers Pension Fund's purchase of close to 45 million pula in shares only resulted in a 4.2% stake in the company. Whether they fully understand that their investment can lead to returns and losses. And what they made of that initial 5 pebe per share dividend that was paid out. In order to create a public that is more knowledgeable on capital and financial markets, the Botswana Stock Exchange has been more than proactive. In March, they had their second annual BSE Listings and Investment Conference, educating the business community on the boss as an alternative source of capital. A few weeks later, they hosted a media training workshop to help ensure that messages to the public regarding the sector is accurate, relatable, and easier to understand for the layperson. We took advantage of both events to get learnings from visiting professionals as to how we can improve efficiencies in terms of financial literacy education. First up is Stacy Warden of the Milken Institute, which is an independent economic think tank whose mission is to improve the lives and economic conditions of people in the U.S. and around the world. 
who tells us of the best practices that she's aware of in terms of educating people on matters of finance and capital. Unfortunately, I think education is just a matter of time and persistence and communication. And so, of course, there are uh, things that we can do now that we couldn't do 10 years ago in terms of mass communication and using the internet um, and using, they call it uh, gamification of things, so learning through playing video in a video game environment, that kind of thing. What is most important is that journalists and politicians and think tanks like mine uh, and people like you and your show just continues to talk about finance topics and economic topics in a way that is sophisticated and not glib and that really shows all, because these are very complicated issues, but people need to understand them. That's what makes smarter investors, that's what makes smarter employers, that's what makes smarter um, policy. And so, you know, at the Milken Institute, it's very important to us that we just keep chipping away at, at making that the public discourse around issues of financial markets and financial market policy um, at a higher level through just constant attempts to educate folks about what we're really talking about when we talk about finance and capital. Would you say the average Amer American versus the average African, um, having worked on the continent for some time, um, have the same appreciation for capital markets and same understanding, same level of participation? The United States has the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world. And so when I was growing up, even as a college student and I first got uh, a job, I thought to myself, I could put savings in a savings account or I could buy a mutual fund. You know, it was always an idea that because they were around us, this diversity of savings outlets. And I didn't really understand exactly what that meant, but I knew that I could participate in the stock market even as a young person. It wasn't very prohibitively expensive. There were a lot of options for me. If I liked a company, um, if I loved a certain brand of clothing, I could maybe invest in the stock of that company. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in Africa, it's not that Africans are less um, economic or financial in the same way. It's just that you have to see it around you. Mm -hmm. And so the more the, the, the more developed that markets come and the more savings or investment products that you have available to you, the more you will avail yourself of those products. And so I think it's, you're absolutely, uh, because you know Africa has a very rich trading history, right? So you understand uh, the key concepts of, you know, buy low and sell high, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of having those kinds of products that people can, can invest in and, and talk about and get smarter about. Whose responsibility is it ultimately when it comes to financial literacy? Is it upon you, the individual, to make sure that you're knowledgeable? Is it up to financial institutions? What about government? We got the opportunity to pick CNBC Africa's Nozipo Mbandra's brain on this one. I think that's one area of responsibility that isn't quite uh, clear. We witness uh, the Botswana Stock Exchange really uh, coming out and taking up part of that responsibility and saying, look, if we begin to empower our financial journalists uh, in our community, we at the very least give them the capacity and the skills to give out relevant and accurate information. And, and so in the process, uh, give the broader citizenry uh, financial literacy. But this is the same responsibility that should lie as early as childhood development. I don't even look at primary school yet, so if you go to early childhood development and really getting young kids to understand the value of money uh, as a basis, and as you move into primary school education, I think uh, financial literacy is absolutely key because you want to get uh, the fundamentals down from a very early age so that young people know that in addition to how money works and what money can do for them, uh, this is how we begin to ignite an entrepreneurial spirit uh, rather than you know, a cohort of young people who are all looking to go through tertiary education so that they can be placed in a job elsewhere or uh, get a position uh, in a government post. We can only create an entrepreneurial spirit and an entrepreneurial culture if we spread out the responsibility of financial literacy. So primary school education, definitely uh, secondary school education and right through uh, up to tertiary. But that being said, I think we cannot exonerate even the family unit, the community within which uh, young people grow up in, as well as the civic organizations that form a part of that community. 
the more we know about what happens in the financial world, the more we can control our own destiny. And I think as citizens, there are different stakeholders who all should equally carry the responsibility of making sure that from as early as possible, financial literacy is part of who we are and what we understand. How would you say the media in the developing world, uh, the role of the media in the developing world and the role of the media in the first world, um, how, how would you say it differs, I should say? I think there is a difference in the levels of development of the different financial markets around yeah. the world. So, for example, I mean, the New York Stock Exchange, we can't begin to compare the New York Stock Exchange with any other stock exchange in, in Africa. And therefore, the analysis and the output that will come out of the New York Stock Exchange is probably much deeper uh, because the market has been uh, is more developed and, it, it's, and has been around for a, a, a much longer time. But I'm very wary of a narrative that might seem to suggest that um, Africans are not as sophisticated in terms of the analysis that they can churn out out of their own uh, markets. I think, you know, I look at myself and I think I'm living proof of the fact that we are just as competent and our analysis is just on point. What we possibly need is just capacity building and skills development so that we have those, the ability and the, and, and the, and the insight to compete with anyone from any other uh, uh, African market. I've seen uh, journalists from Africa become really fantastic global journalists in other media. And that's really because what's different is perhaps the depth of the market, but the understanding is the same. And maybe what I would like to probably see more of is more um, shorter term um, or shorter duration, uh, whether it's workshops or courses that are affordable, um, because these tend to be very expensive, that really give journalists the kind of um, insights and the kind of tools that will allow them to be globally competitive. These days, if you really want to understand uh, the stock market and, and really get uh, uh, into a course that will go into depth around how do, how do, how do we trade shares, how do we, how do we do mergers and acquisitions, it's often tied up in a three, four year long course on something else. And even the shorter courses can be very inaccessible from a cost perspective. So what the BSC is doing in terms of running workshops that are free of charge for the journalists is actually exceptionally important um, because that's what's going to allow us to be uh, globally competitive. And I think once we've got that um, and the more we continue to build on the fundamentals that are already in place, um, African journalists can operate anywhere. As promised, we will be giving away double tickets to the West Bank Botswana International Air Show taking place next weekend in Rasesa to three lucky viewers each week. All you have to do is visit the First Issue's Facebook page, comment on and share the video of tonight's program. Winners will be announced on the show next week. With that, it's good night from me, Namito Samakula, and the First Issue's team.